Hey, welcome to my channel. This is my main message for the week as I work my way through the book of 2 Peter. Slowly, decisively, this is a great book, great little epistle, a letter. And um, what I, I call this, this lesson, this message, 2 Peter 2, 17 through 22, I call it, Who Do You Listen To? It's important. Now, hope you'll subscribe to my channel if you haven't yet. Uh, about 45% of the people who listen to my videos are not subscribed. Subscribing helps me. I'm trying to get uh, uh, get to the point where I can be monetized and spend a little more time uh, working on this stuff, which would be great. <clears throat> um, so I hope you subscribe, and I hope you hit the bell so you get notified every time I put things out. I put stuff out every day. And uh, give me thumbs up, make comments, do what you can to help me get this out to more people. My mission, teach the Bible and help people, one, come to Christ, second, develop a biblical worldview, which is lacking in the world and in the United States. Let's take a minute and pray. Father, speak to us through this amazing passage of Scripture. <clears throat> uh, take your word, apply it to our hearts, make us different because we heard from you, Father. Help us figure out who to listen to as we go through this. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Way back in August 1973, I started Bible College at Pacific Christian College in Fullerton, California. It's Hope International University now. It is a conservative Bible college kind of a place. And, and uh, that start began an adventure through introduction to the New Testament, a class that went on for a complete year, four hours a week for a complete year. The professor was a man that I knew well. He had been the pastor of our church in Flagstaff, Arizona for about three years when I was a young teen, which I was a knucklehead when I was that age, but uh, but I knew him. His name was Dr. Paul McReynolds. Dr. McReynolds held a PhD in New Testament Greek studies. The, the man was then and is now, he's still living in his, in his later 80s up on the Central California coast, but he's a, a, just a world-class Greek scholar. He helped some of the greatest Greek scholars in the world put together study tools for Greek and things like that. He's a tremendous scholar. The text for the class was one thing, one thing only. It was a Greek-English interlinear New Testament, period, full stop. That's all we could use. The class consisted of writing a notebook of what was called inductive studies based on the New Testament text for that week. We worked through the entire New Testament during the course of the year. The rules were, this, were these. No outside source could be used. Okay, You could not use commentaries, no commentaries, no opinions from anybody else. The point was, was very simple. The point was to go to the text of the scripture for the truth and listen to God's word in the text and study it inductively with an interlinear literal a literal English Greek translation from the interlinear and, and study the New Testament words. Um, often students in the class would ask, they'd say, Dr. McReynolds, what do you think this text means? His answer was consistent. Listen to the text and you tell me what it says. Okay. His point was that God speaks through the text of Scripture. And we were learning to listen to God through Scripture. Folks, that's huge. And it's missing in action in much of the Christian universe. False teachers have always afflicted the people of God. Always. Way back in ancient Israel, in New Testament times, today. False teachers afflict the people of God. The question needs to be asked, who do you listen to? Who do you listen to? Never the false teacher and always listen to God through the text of Scripture. So here are three reasons to never listen to the false teacher. First is in 2 Peter 3, verse 17. These men are springs without water and mists driven by a storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them. First, Never listen to the false teacher because he's empty. He's empty. These men, in verse 17, refers to the false teachers. Who, and the false teacher is the subject 
of the paragraph, of the whole paragraph. Three, three phrases describe the emptiness of the false teacher. I want to look at them under point number one. First, he is a spring without water. What do springs produce? Well, the answer is that springs produce water. The real teacher produces water, while the false teacher comes up empty, empty. A spring without water is totally unproductive and totally useless. This water is the authentic, what, what water is the authentic teacher passing out? What are we talking about? Jesus talked about water in John 4, 13 and 14, when he encountered a woman at the well. Great, great story in the 14th, in the fourth chapter of John. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, water from the well. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So what does Jesus mean by the water he gives? Well, he's talking about the Holy Spirit coming to live in the Christ follower. The Holy Spirit is the person, presence, and power of God moving into your life, moving into a person's life when he becomes a Christian, when he says yes to Jesus as Lord. And it becomes a spring welling up to eternal life. It's the water that brings life to your soul. The water is the Spirit of God living in you, and he is the source of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, a personal relationship with God through Christ. The spring is functional when you know God and have a personal relationship with him by the Holy Spirit moving into your life and living in you. The false teacher is completely empty of the, of the capacity of providing a relationship with God. So don't bother listening to him. He's empty, totally empty. Second, the false teacher is a mist driven by a storm. That's the second point under point number one. He is a, he's, a, he's empty. He's a mist driven by a storm. In, in nature, a mist driven by a storm is a cloud full of water that produces rain coming, you know, going down. The point is that it has no stability. It moves around. It'll rain here and it'll rain there. We've had a really rainy season here in central California where I live, and it'll, it'll rain and it'll move over here and it'll rain over there. The, the point is that the false teacher is completely without staying power, another emptiness thing going on, completely without staying power, it moves around like a mist, okay? In Matthew 24, 35, Jesus defines what does have staying power. He said this, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Where do his words end up? They end up in Scripture. They will never pass away. Eternity will pass away. Earth will pass away. His word will stand. That's why we need to listen to it. The false teacher will almost always make reference to Scripture, but he will consistently twist and contort it to say what he wants, not what it says. Not what it says. So why do you suppose Dr. McReynolds insisted that we listen to the text of Scripture? It's the Word of God. It has staying power. Profound. I, a year of that. <clears throat> I'll never get away from it. And I'm grateful to God for that. Third, third point under, under point number one, the false teacher is so empty of any truth that blackest darkness is reserved for him. The blackest darkness describes the nether regions, and it makes reference really to probably to hell, okay? Uh, never listen to a guy who's headed for hell in a handbasket, okay? Because he's empty of anything that can help. And he's empty of anything that is, has truth. He is devoid of truth. Never listen to the false teacher because he's empty. He's empty. Second Peter 2, 18 and 19. For they mouth boastful words by appealing to the lustful desires of human nature. They entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom while they themselves are slaves to depravity. For a man is a slave to whatever has mastered him. Second point. Second major point. Never listen to the false teacher as he enslaves people. So how does the false teacher enslave people? Well, he starts by using empty and boastful words. The word translated boastful is important. It's the, it's the Greek word hyperonica, hyperonica. 
and, and it means swollen and excessive in size. Such teasing is boastful. It's filled up with stuff that's swollen and, ex and extensive, excessive in size. And it's basically, it's filled with propaganda. That's a good word for what it's filled with. It's also appealing to the lustful and sinful nature of humanity, false teaching is. The nature of this teaching is that emer it, listen, this is so important. It emerges from man, not from God. Notice that the false teacher's teaching appeals to those just escaping from those who live in error. Who's he talking about? The guy just escaping from those who live in error is the person who is new in Christ, who just came out of the world, just escaped from everybody who's living in error. He's new, he's not solid, he's not grounded, and he's easily confused and sucked into nonsense. The person is like the post in wet cement that has not set up yet, okay? He hasn't been in long enough to be established and in place and solid. It takes, takes time to be established in Christ, and the newer believer is easily dragged off into false teaching because his base is not hardened by solid teaching over time, solid biblical teaching from the scriptures. I've seen this over and over. The new believer gets enticed away from solid biblical teaching by the false teacher, and he's dragged off into error. And there's so many sources for it today. It used to be just, you know, 30 years ago, it was just television. But now it's TV and all kinds of social media stuff. And there's, it, it, it takes absolutely not a penny to get on social media and, and start teaching something. And a lot of people say, wow, that sounds great. And they just kind of get sucked into it. The nature of the false teacher is that he'll promise freedom from law and error, while at the same time getting, getting people enslaved to depravity. I was thinking about Jim Jones. I don't know if you're old enough to remember him, but he was with a church called People's Temple. And I'm very familiar with this. It was a Disciples of Christ church, which is a a Christian denomination uh, that I'm very familiar with. And he was a pastor in that church, trained in a Bible college, in a seminary too. And he, he, he ended up being a false teacher. He led his people to Guyana in 1990, 1978, and 909 of those people were, were killed by drinking his Kool-Aid, which killed everybody, okay? He promised freedom from error and false teaching while dragging people off into death by mass suicide, the ultimate slavery and depravity, a false teacher. F folks, those people were killed by false teaching, okay? Jones was a false teacher promising freedom that led people to death by suicide. He led them to slavery and depravity by death. False teachers will do that kind of thing. And they have, it happens all the time. A lot of the teaching out there is false. Yeah, so here's the bottom line. If those folks had listened to God in Scripture instead of a dude, instead of a guy, they would not have died by way of false teaching. You've got to learn to listen to God in the Scripture. Second Peter 2, 20 through 22 says this, if they had escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and overcome, they are worse off at the end than they, than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them to not have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and turned their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them, the Proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit and a sow is washed. The sow that is washed goes back to her wallowing in the mud. Third main point, never listen to the false teacher as he's worse off at the end than he is at the beginning. That's the nature of the false teacher. The scholars, this is great, they fuss about whether the false teacher was saved and then rejected Christ and was lost. They can't figure that out. And I, I read all the material on that, you know, and listened very carefully to it. And when that happens, guess what I do? I go back to the text of scripture. That's what I did. Simple. The text says that the false teacher had escaped the corruption, had in the past escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's not too hard to figure out. He'd come to know Christ. 
Verse 21 assumes that they had known the way of righteousness. If he'd known the way of righteousness, he'd come to know Christ. Verse 20 clearly says that they are entangled again in the corruption of the world. And verse 21 says that they turned their backs on the sacred command. In other words, they were in and they turned their back on it somehow. Okay, The last person on earth you would want to listen to is the guy who knew Christ and turned away or who knew the way of righteousness and backed out on it. Why would you listen to him? He's got it all twisted around and all goofed up. Now, I've had a bunch of dogs in my life. And I, I'm i 74 years old. I've had dogs when I was a little kid, and I've had a bunch while I was raising my family. And dogs all do the same thing, okay? Most of them will vomit and they'll go back and eat it. That's disgusting, but that's what they do. The false teacher is like the dog returning to his vomit. He goes back to the vile way of life that was discharged from him when he came to know Christ. He goes back to it. It's like the dog returning to his vomit. He is the last person on earth you'd want to listen to. Our granddaughter uh, will turn 16 next month. She's in FFA, Future Farmers of America. You know what she's doing? She's raising a pig, okay? The pig is a, a light gray color and his name is Smokey. She gave him a name. Smokey, can, she can hose him down and get all cleaned up and immediately goes back and wallows in the mud. You know, it's because he's a pig. He doesn't know any better. Why would a person listen to someone who got all cleaned up by knowing Christ and then jumped right back into the mud of sin again? Doesn't make any sense. I will always remember the student who asked Dr. McReynolds what he thought about the scripture, what he thought about the rapture. He used that word. We were studying the book of Revelation. Dr. McReynolds, what do you think about the rapture? You know what he said? Here's what he said. I'm sorry, but I don't know what you're referring to. I've never seen that word in the scripture. You know why I said that? That word's not in the scripture. That word is not in the scripture. He said that because it's not there, okay? It is a concept that emerged from someone's interpretation, and they tagged that, that, that uh, title to it, the rapture. But that word's not in scripture. So... How do you avoid it? You know, maybe it describes a, um, a concept that is legitimate in some way, but the word is not in Scripture. Now, I mean, I'm a simple guy, okay? I go for just go with the Scripture. So how do you avoid false teaching? Listen to God speak in the text of Scripture. It's that simple. That's why you need to know the Bible. And again, I hope you'll subscribe, hit the bell, and make comments, and I want to pray again. Father, I pray that you'd teach us to listen to the text of Scripture. That's where your word is, Lord. And I pray that we'd hear you, and you transform our life, and make us new because we heard from you. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Talk to you soon.